Ladies and gentlemen and everybody, put your hands together for Dr. Lisa Mayoa Reynolds. I am the daughter of Margaret, who is the daughter of Mabel. My mother moved to Detroit and grew up in Evergreen, Alabama, where there was fresh air and sunshine. I grew up on collard greens, cornbread, black eyed peas, and sweet potato pies. I grew up in love. My mother moved to Michigan to support her brother who was working at Chrysler and his family was growing large. And then he introduced her to my dad who was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1918. His parents migrated to Detroit from Georgia. Legend is told that my grandfather was run out of town for having the audacity to own a business, and then he changed his name when he moved to Detroit to Waterman, and he's the founder of Waterman and Sons Printing Company. I grew up in love. My siblings were all 20, 25, 26, 27 years older than me by the time I came on the scene. They even had children of their own. My oldest brother was in law school, graduate of FAMU and Central State practicing law. He fought Pontiac School District for ex facto segregation and won. I grew up in a family of love and consciousness and black love, real love, you see. When we went to school back in the day at McDowell Elementary and Bobian Middle School and Mumford High School, we would walk to school. I remember our neighborhood, a white neighborhood with only two black families between one and four, but in 67 at the uprising, as black folks call it, the riot as historians refer to it. In that year, between that year and the next year, by the time I went to kindergarten, our whole neighborhood had flipped and we had two white families in the sea of black faces. I, I had a great education and I had a, amazing teachers. And throughout my educational experience, I would always have opportunities for bullies or whatever we used to call them back in the day. And they would come to me and they would say, is your mama white? No. <laughs> is your daddy white? Hell no because they weren't. And every time I look in the mirror, I would just see me a reflection of all the different shades in my family. I wondered why they were so courageous and bold to invade my personal space and question my humanity about somebody being white. I don't even know any white people. Then as I grew up and traveled and moved away, I gave birth to my firstborn. I was 26 years old. I came back to Detroit to visit my family and another family member was making conversation. She was talking about how they were having a debate whether I would have a girl or a boy. And she simply said casually to me one day in her kitchen, she said, well, how will we, hell, how will we know what Lisa would have? She was adopted. And I simply said to her, I didn't know. I think she thought I was saying, I didn't know they had had this discussion, but I was saying, I didn't know I was adopted. I was, I was stunned and, and shaken and shattered and destabilized and I kept it secret. I went back to Panama and I shared my experience with my then husband and for some reason I, got the understanding that he knew, and he told me I was to never speak of it again. Well, I knew that was the beginning of the end of that relationship. <laughs> so two years later, as we were in the midst of our divorce, he called my parents and told them that I knew and that I was seeking, even though I wasn't, because I was so destabilized by the news. My parents called me in their room, and they tell me, we met you when you were six months old, and we fell in love with you, and we've loved you every day since. You are ours, bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh. Haven't we treated you like a princess? Haven't we loved you and given you everything you need? And the answer, of course, is yes. 
And then my mother went on to tell me, and when you turn 18, I destroyed all the paperwork because you don't need to know about any of that. You are mine and I am yours. And so I hid that secret and I hid that pain and that crack in my black love because I didn't want to be disrespectful because I was raised by a Southern mother. It will be another 30 years and within those 30 years, I created my own black family with Baba Lumumba and the children, Jabari and Khalil and our family grew and I began to work at Aisha Shule, affirmative school for gifted children and Fellowship Chapel, where we are Christ-rooted and African-centered, where our iconography is of an East African Palestinian Jesus, and no white Jesus for my kids. And so it is that as I, I built my own family, I was a part of a community of 100 Detroiters that was in a book called Atlas of Detroit. And a part of the photo shoot, we had to give our DNA so that they would tell us and show us from where we are from in the world. And I got the results back, and I saw that 48% West African, 2% indigenous, and 50% European. And I had to make peace with the truth of that DNA reality, although it was difficult, because like I said, by this time, I still don't know any white folks. I might work with a few, but... I'm from Detroit. I'm from Coleman Alexander Young's Detroit, Michigan, where everybody is somebody, and we are all about black love. So I had to make peace with that. And so then, a few years later, I had the courage to do 23andMe. My sister-in-law, Vicki, she did it and revealed some things that what I thought was really destabilizing in her life, but she took it in stride, so she gave me courage. So I did 23andMe, and there was a young lady on there who was a first cousin. She was my oldest daughter's age. I checked her out on Facebook, because that's what you do when you want to know something about somebody. And she was a little turned up for me. I said, no, nah, you reach out to her. So my oldest daughter reached out to her, and they connected. And then she put her mother, and we had a four-way text going, because we were trying to figure out how were we first cousins. And we were talking and texting. And then one day, this first cousin, she said, her mother said, yeah, you know, my mama told me she gave up a baby at birth for adoption, and her name was Lisa. And I was in Marshalls on 8 Mile, and I ran over to the furniture section, and I fell into one of those couches and chairs, and I sobbed. And it was back in COVID, so a lady came over from fellowship. I didn't know her face or her name, but she had on a mask. She offered me some tissue and a bottle of water. She didn't judge me. She didn't ask me what was wrong. She just knew that I was a mess in Marshalls in the furniture section. Now, you know that's a little teeny tiny section. I found whatever I could hold myself up with. And so now I needed to know for myself. I needed to read it for myself. So I petitioned the adoptive services. And the way the law goes, because I was born in 1963, the way it goes is they have to contact your birth parents and say that you want to reach out to them. And if they say no, then it, communication ends. But if they are deceased, they send you a copy of the death certificate. And so it is that I received those two death certificates. And I found out that my, my birth mother had changed her name to Queen Fakan Allah. That's deep, ain't it, if you know anything about me. <laughs> and so I opened up the sealed letters and conversations and narratives about my life, and I found that she was this beautiful 19-year-old black woman from Adrian, Michigan. She came down to Detroit at Crittenden Hospital where young unwed mothers would give birth to be given up for adoption. She was there for five days before I was born, and it took her another five days to turn me over to the foster system and another 10 months before she would sign away her parental rights. She wanted so desperately to keep me. Now, she told the nuns that my daddy was a black man in Alabama in jail, a racist trope that's very easy to believe from an unwed black mother. And then I was born. <laughs> 
<laughs> Blue eyes and curly red hair, they was like, you want to recant your story? <laughs> so she apologized for her betrayal. She said she prayed and prayed that I wouldn't come out looking like her lover, my father. She said they were in love and he was in the military and he wrote to her, but she did not write him back and she did not tell him that she was pregnant with a child. She was trying to keep me, but she didn't have support. Her family wouldn't even come to Detroit to help her sign the papers. At 19, you still needed an adult to sign the papers. And so I began to put the pieces of the puzzle of my life together and make peace with the pieces of the puzzle to know how difficult it was for a young, black, 19-year-old unwed mother from Adrian, Michigan, and how her pain became my mother's greatest joy because I know that I was created to be her daughter because she loved me with every fiber of her being. See, I was raised in love on collard greens, cornbread, black eyed peas, and sweet potato pies. She loved me so fiercely. She never worked. She took care of me. When I went to Mumford and was in the dance team and the cheer team, she packed me two lunches. I was the envy of all the kids because my mama loved me. So I know that I was born in love and I was raised in love and so I bring their names forth in this story because their love and my life is their justice because their justice out loud is the love that I share with my family, with my students, and with you. I'm so glad that things turned out the way that they did. And I'm so glad to know that no matter what I look like, I am a black woman. <laughs>